this talk is not super, super long, uh, and, and it's intentionally done that way. So without further ado, um, I wanted to overview what is IgE. It's one of the four types of human immunoglobulins. So everyone is very familiar with IgG. Um, it's what's in your immunoglobulin replacement if you're on immunoglobulin replacement. IgA is what lines our mucous membranes um, and is one and a deficiency or a complete absence of IgA is pretty much the most common form of primary immunodeficiency. IgM is usually found in this pentamer or snowflake looking um, shape in the peripheral blood and it is not replaceable, um, but it can also be low or elevated um, as a sign of primary immunodeficiency. But the you know specialty star immunoglobulin of the day for us today is IG IgE. Um, and so what conditions are associated with high IgE? By and far, the most common reason why we see high IgE is because a patient has severe eczema. Um, and often, but not always, that's associated with a predisposition to having other allergic conditions, such as food allergies, asthma, etc. We can also see an elevated IgE in concert with parasitic infections, a, an entity called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. This is uh, an IgE-mediated inflammatory response to um, exposure to the fungus aspergillus, but is not generally associated with aspergillus infection. It's more commonly seen if you have an underlying lung disease such as asthma or cystic fibrosis. We also will see a high IgE in patients who have allergic fungal sinusitis. It can commonly be elevated in later stages of HIV or in patients who have a neoplasm or lymphoma. But what we're here to talk about today are primary immunodeficiencies associated with elevations in IgE. And that's usually in the so-called um, hyper-IgE syndromes, although we're really kind of getting away from that umbrella term and really trying to think of these diseases more specifically to the exact pathway that has led to their uh, presentation with a high IgE and combined immunodeficiencies. But to just kind of give a quick overview of why IgE um, you know, is produced and how it comes to be. So this is a B cell. It has, it's expressing IgE. It comes ex into uh, you know, contact um, with um, peanut. We end up with a whole bunch of IgE produced. That then binds to receptors on the mast cells. And when those receptors that have IgE bound um, come in contact with an allergen, then we get uh, the symptoms of allergic disease, sneezing, hives, very bad eczema, runny nose, anaphylaxis, the works. But what about IgE immunodeficiency? Where does this come up? So I already mentioned that we see it in combined immunodeficiency, Omen syndrome being a, a form of skid that has a, a leaky phenotype where we're making some T cells that run amok and cause inflammation in the skin. Um, and indeed, the definition of combined immunodeficiency includes severe eczema and has high IgE as part of it. There are also these so-called highs syndromes, but again, we're getting away from that term. And then there are diseases that weren't classified typically, you know, in the past as high syndrome, but are known to have always been associated with high IgE. So um, Dr. Milner is now going to uh, take over and talk about a few syndromes, and then I'll transition back to talking about a few other syndromes. We're going to tag team this talk, and then we'll take a bunch of questions. Excellent. So... Um just to be clear, both Dr. Heimel and I are pediatric allergists and immunologists. That's what our, our background is. Um, and uh, we've actually worked uh, together for a number of years at, a, at one point in time in the distant past. Um, so, okay. So, um, <clears throat> a very important point, like the most important point, I, in, in, and Dr. Heimel touched on it nicely, I'll get more uh, firm about it. The hyper-IG syndrome is actually a terrible term. It really, really messes everything up, okay? Um, because, and we'll, we'll get to it in a minute, but the bottom line is there are syndromes. There are people who have high IgE, and there are some people who have high IgE and have a syndrome, okay? But there is no the hyper IgE syndrome. It is absolutely confusing, um, and, and really both for patients and providers. 
Um, this is not inside information. It's a problem on a daily basis for us. It causes problems for families because of that bad label. Okay, and we'll get into that in a little bit more. Okay, so first of all, what does it mean a syndrome? Okay, you can have syndromic ear protrusion. But <laughs> does that mean I have a syndrome? I don't know, right? Um, so we think about the symptom happens early on in life. That's what a syndrome can be. Other family members have something related. It doesn't have to be that everybody has exactly the same thing, right? But you could have multiple things going on that have nothing to do. Like you could have syndromic ear uh, protrusion and eczema. You might go, oh, that, that could be, that could be. Um, when there are infections going on in addition to the high IgE. So that's pretty critical, okay? By the time someone hits age three, and I can tell you this, it's almost for sure, 99.9% .9 of people who are gonna have a syndrome that's wrong with their immune system that's causing the high IgE, they're gonna have infections by age three. And if they don't, it's just not that, okay? It's that simple. I mean, there's almost nobody who by the time of age, age three who don't have significant infections going on. And I, I don't mean a little, little ear infection every now and then and um, some super infection of their skin because of uh, the bad eczema. Um, we're talking about pneumonias. We're talking about um, you know, never being able to be off the antibiotics. Um, if that's not happening during childhood, it's something else. It's not a syndrome hope associated with high, it's, it's not, not going to be one of the things that you read in the book of the hyper IgE syndrome. It's just if, if you don't have those infections happening. There could be other syndromic reasons you have high IgE, but now it's something different. That's the point. Um, you might have, in addition to protruding ears, you may have other connective tissue problems. Very common, right? Um, the face might look different. Okay? Very, very often, and I, 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 hate, I hate to give you this piece of insider information, but you would come in and, and when, when tell the doc, I think my, my child's face looks weird, and the doc says, can I see pictures of mom and dad? You know, we just want to know. We just, we just want to know, okay? So, um, but it is, it, is um, it, it actually matters, because that's going to tell us, is this a syndrome or not, right? And by the way, mom or dad might have this syndrome, right? We don't know. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, the hypermobile joints is one of the main things that comes up because historically that was what was associated with a certain, one of the syndromes with high IgE was having very hypermobile joints. 20% um, of adolescent uh, girls have hypermobile joints. 20% of all adolescent girls have hypermobile joints. So that means that 20% of people who have a high IgE are going to look like a syndrome. And they don't really have it. You understand? It just overlaps a ton. If you talk to our dentist friends, tons of people have to get their teeth pulled when they're children. Tons of people, okay? So just because you happen to have to have a tooth pulled and you have high IgE does not mean that you necessarily have a syndrome, okay? So just to, to get that, it's in the textbook, but that doesn't mean that's what your kid has or what your patient has. Uh, and believe me, I, I would say there's no difference between the docs and the, and the patients on the confusion on this. It's, it's all the same. Um, okay. You can do it. Ah, autoimmune problems. Okay, so allergy, not autoimmune. Okay, allergy is not an autoimmune problem, despite what doctors and other people might say. It has nothing to autoimmune means you're attacking yourself. An allergy, you're attacking something from the outside. Okay, it's messing yourself up, but it's it's very very different. But if you have type one diabetes early onset, or if you have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or if you have um, th um, thyroid uh, thyroiditis, and, or, and, and, and a number of other immune problems that started early in life, then you might say, okay, that might be part of a syndrome, that part of that problem is also allergies, okay? So infections, autoimmune, um, with, with the high IgE and allergies, could be, as well as non-immune problems like connective tissue problems. Um, ah, recurrent fevers and ulcers, not autoimmune, and usually actually not infectious either, okay? If you have recurrent fevers and ulcers, that tends to be auto-inflammatory. Auto-inflammatory disorders do not need, they're not attacking self, they're not attacking something from, that's foreign, they're actually, it's like there's a little motor in your immune system that just is running, and that's causing fevers, and it's causing things like ulcers, it might cause colitis, um, it might cause an awful rash, even different than eczema. Those are auto-inflammatory problems, and you can see those in people who have high, fee, uh, high IgE as well, and that would point you towards it being a, a syndrome. Okay, 
so many people who have syndromes that are associated with high IgE can have normal IgE, right? So again, hyper IgE syndrome doesn't mean anything if you don't even have high IgE, but you've got the same problem. That's, that's why I wouldn't classify it that way. Um, and I would say almost every primary immune deficiency has people who have high IgE, like every single one of them, just about. Okay, I mean, they might be leaky or this or that. Every, almost every genetic defect can be associated with, with high IgE, depending on the situation. Um, and this is just an example um, of, these are just pathways in a, in a T cell or a B cell um, that's in your blood, in your white blood cells. Um, um, in red is all the mutations that you could have that cause people to have elevated IgE or allergic problems. Um, and almost every one of those is something that also causes a more classical primary immune deficiency that may or may not be associated with high IgE. Okay, just to give you the idea. This should be small enough that you can't pick one out there. Okay, so here's, um, <laughs> here is just a list um, of a few, not even all of them, but a, a good number of disorders that are classically associated with high IgE. At the top of the list, we'll get to it more, is the one that spawned the whole hyper IgE syndrome. I'm gonna get to it in a second, but I would point out that now three more disorders have been described. Um, this one shh, comes out on Monday. <laughs> Nobody knows about this. Um, so um, you, you are the first to hear about this, sort of. Um, the, um, the, these um, three other disorders look a lot like Job syndrome, which is caused by mutations in STAT3, which I'll get to, basically because they're in the same pathway. They're in the same signaling pathway, and so they look very similar, and I'm gonna get into the des description, but um, that, that's just something I wanted to, to just point out, that now there are all of these. Um, then there's a DOC8 uh, deficiency, um, which at the time, people said, oh, that's, that's the explanation for the autosomal recessive hyper-IgE syndrome, okay? We knew even then, there could be a billion different reasons people have recessive um, 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 hyper IgE syndromes, um, and uh, this is one of them. Okay, and it's also there are people who have DOC8 deficiency who don't have high IgE. So just to point that out, um, PGM3 deficiency, which we uh, described as a, just another recessive version. Um, I say version; it's completely different than having DOC8 deficiency. Um, CARD11 mutations that we, we recently described um, at the NIH, it's a dominantly inherited, mom can give it to son, can give it to granddaughter and siblings, um, dominantly inherited uh, syndrome associated with high IgE and infections and eczema. So is it the autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome? Do you see the problem? It's an autosomal dominant syndrome associated with high IgE and infections. So why is it not the... So that's why the title is really not helpful. And you're gonna take care of these incredibly differently in certain ways between STAT3 deficiency and CARD11 dominant negative mutation. Um, what's got Aldrich syndrome, um, IPEX, uh, which is a classically associated syndrome that can cause, what we're gonna get to in a little bit, but the bottom line is they can have high IgE and it's a syndrome. So why isn't it a hyper IgE syndrome? Okay, um, and then um, there are other types. So this uh, the, um, FOXP3 deficiency, which causes IPEX, you can totally have high IgE and lots of allergies and all kinds of autoimmune problems, tons and tons of autoimmune problems. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then just as another class of mutation, Netherton syndrome, which is due to SPINK5 mutations, this is where the problem is in your skin. It's not in your immune system per se. And it's a barrier problem in your skin. The net result is horrible eczema and you can get infections because you've got this barrier problem. Um, but your immune system, if you got a bone marrow transplant, it would do absolutely nothing for you because the problem is the physical skin barrier problem, you see? So that's why it matters what kind of different thing it is that you have. And actually we even think that other more subtle problems with the skin barrier might determine whether if you have another kind of immune deficiency, you'll have eczema or not, you see? So it's not totally straightforward. Okay, here we go. Oh, there was music. Well, let's see, hold on. Oh, darn it. Oh, that didn't work at all. So that didn't, oh, this is such a shame. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, folks encountered patients with extremely high IgE, some of whom had significant infections and other issues. One particular was called Job syndrome, which ultimately was found to be caused by STAT3 mutations. Job syndrome was described in 1966. 
1972, we could measure IgE for the first time. And so they measured it in the patients who had Job syndrome and found, oh my goodness, it's through the roof. And so they must have hyper-IgE, and they already have a syndrome, so it got called hyper-IgE syndrome because of that. That's the history. That's how it got there. Um, but without a genetic test, one could only rely on the clinical and lab data to help figure out whether something was a, genetic, a specific genetic disease. So having high IgE, usually with recurrent or severe infections, probably with other systemic issues, was called the hyper-IG syndrome. Based on how it was inherited, it was then called autosomal dominant versus autosomal recessive hyper-IG syndrome. But with genetic testing, a new force in medicine, we've begun to rebel against the way we used to think about things. Oh, now it does it. Look at that. All right, whatever. So, <laughs> hold on. Stat wars. So the problem, the problem is that STAT3 deficiency is STAT3 deficiency. Once we know what it is, let's not call it the hyper-IG syndrome because it is a focused, actual, specific thing. And if you don't have a STAT3 mutation, you don't have this syndrome, period, right? That's the point. Um, so this is just, um, this is a, you know, a live photograph of uh, Satan smiting Job with boils and his wife not being very happy. Um, and um, the point... <laughs> the, uh, the point is, it was STAT3 deficiency. The main things that they can get are recurrent staph skin abscesses and lung cysts. Um, the more that the skin is carefully taken care of and that the lungs are carefully taken care of, the less these things happen. If you catch it early enough, if you diagnose it early enough, you can actually prevent a lot of the infectious stuff that happens. Um, and in fact, as they get older, the infections are less and less and less and less. So if you get out of childhood, you're actually in pretty good shape. Um, recurrent uh, pneumococcal and gram-negative infections, not much issues with viruses. So if you come in and you tell me you've got warts and you've got herpes, uh, uh, you know, infections in the mouth um, and molluscum and all sorts of stuff like that, it's probably not Job syndrome, okay? It's probably not STAT3 deficiency, but it might be another syndrome associated with high IgE, okay? Um, they can get um, chronic um, um, thrush, or, and, and, or other mucocutaneous candidiasis, um, candida infections all around, uh, yeast infections. Uh, they get, oh, I've put in the quotes from the Book of Job, just in case you're bored. Um, and, and you can see that the Book of Job actually um, does, does describe a lot of the things that happened, although Job got it when he was older, which, mm -mm, that's not possible. Um, so even if you live with someone, it's not going to happen. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, Severe atopic dermatitis, really high IgE. Interestingly, these patients who have the STAT3 mutations are protected from bad allergic reactions. Okay? They actually don't get bad reactions. STAT3 is critical for a mast cell to degranulate. STAT3 is critical for your blood vessels to respond to histamine. Okay? We've actually gotten umbilical vein, uh, umbilical cord um, from STAT3 mutant babies, um, and um, we drop histamine on it and nothing happens. Whereas if you do it from a baby who doesn't have the mutation, as you might imagine, it dilates and, and, it, and it gets swollen, okay? So it's kind of remarkable, but it actually, again, very much separates, and my goodness, I don't know who spelled that, but it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> anaphylaxis is not spelled that way. Um, Frequent fractures, and, 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 and in fact, with um, Job syndrome in general, um, and I'm going to call it Job syndrome, but I think STAT3 dominant negative is the best term to use. Um, um, fractures of bones without significant um, trauma. And the other tricky part is the same issue that happens with um, the... Um, uh, the anaphylaxis or the allergic reactions, it's also true for inflammation in general. So when a patient with Job's gets like, let's say an abscess, it's a cold abscess. It doesn't get hot and painful the way that a typical abscess does. Same thing for the broken bones. They don't often even know that the bone is broken, okay? CPS has totally been called. They do an x-ray, hey, kid's got 12 breaks. What's going on here? Well, didn't even know. Didn't it hurt, not, didn't hurt enough and didn't, didn't get inflamed enough to, to go to the doc, okay? Um, yes, the retained childhood teeth, this is different than crowding, okay? You can have teeth pulled because you're crowding, that's different, that's not what goes on. This is that the baby teeth simply will not come out. Then you have to pull them out. And then of course, the joint hypermobility. And again, I, these quotes, they're direct <laughs> translations. Um, 
Okay, this is um, a Panorex, and you can sort of even see that's an adult tooth trying to get in to the baby tooth right there, okay? Um, this is what I call a <laughs> Job's patient giving you the finger, but it's his pinky. Um, and that's a pretty cool trick, but it's nothing particularly tricky for someone who has step three uh, loss of function. Okay, all right, everybody stop doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is this is this is we're, we're doing this for pleasure right now, not work. Um, all right, uh, degenerative joint disease definitely happens, and it could well be because of the hypermobility to some extent. Um, very much unrelated to the immune system, just we think um, coronary artery aneurysms. You can find them in almost everybody. Something wrong with the vasculature. Very very few people actually have a consequence of it, but it does. They are there. Um, there is absolutely eosinophilic esophagitis. I love that quote. And um, there is a facial asymmetry. This is, uh, these are a bunch of folks who have um, hyper IG syndrome due to um, step three dominant negative mutations. Autoimmune disease is present um, and uh, lymphoma is actually increased uh, as well uh, in the folks who have it. And this just shows um, these other syndromes that have been described. Um, recently, there is a molecule down here called ZNF341, which is necessary for stat three to turn itself on, okay? So the people who are missing it, autosomal recessive, okay? But yet they have something that looks a whole lot like stat three loss of function, okay? They still don't have the viral problems. Looks a whole lot like um, stat three loss of function. There are people who have a mutation in GP130, um, which is called IL6FT right here. Um, that's this, which help basically is the receptor for a lot of cytokines that use stat three in the game of telephone to tell um, the cell what to do. And then this is the thing that literally coming out on Monday, IL-6 receptor. This is the thing, has anyone ever been offered tocilizumab as a medication or heard? We've talked about it this yeah, morning. so tocilizumab is a drug that blocks IL-6 that we give to people with rheumatoid arthritis that is given, it's being considered for graft versus host disease um, for, um, what's that? It's that one gain of function, right? So a number of Disorders uh, where if you blocked it, stat three gain of function, of course. Um, number of disorders, if you block IL-6, you might actually um, help those disorders. Um, well, if you block IL-6 from birth, that's what it looks like is stat three loss of function. Very similar, okay? Very, very similar. Um, and in fact, um, the company that makes tocilizumab is no longer marketing it or trying to market it for under two-year-olds because when they were given the drug, they had an incredibly high rate of allergic reactions to the drug. So it's like you need to have that IL-6 signaling working for you early on in life to prevent you from having all the allergic problems. Um, it's not as big of a problem later um, in life. So don't worry about taking that tocilizumab um, if you have to. DOC8 deficiency, so we're gonna move on from stat three loss of function to DOC8 deficiency. It's recessive. They have recurrent sinopulmonary infections as well, and they can get staph eczema, staph Abscesses to some extent and bad eczema as well that is due to staph. Um, and, but they have bad food and drug allergies and anaphylaxis. Totally different than STAT3. A main reason, DOC8, not expressed in mast cells. Okay, it's not, or if it is, it's got other um, things that compensate for it. So their mast cells work great. Um, they definitely get viral infections much, much more. They are at very much increased risk for malignancy, mostly from those viral infections to some extent. Um, and so that's, that's really different than stat three loss of function, okay? Um, they almost invariably need bone marrow transplants. Almost invariably they need bone marrow transplants. Stat three loss of function, we're still in the middle of trying to figure that out because a lot of what stat three does has nothing to do with the immune system. So doing the bone marrow transplant, it's not clear. There have been like 10 or so, maybe, maybe a little bit more patients with stat three loss of functions who have transplants. Some have done better, some have not. A lot of it has to do with how bad they were beforehand. So it's hard to say um, exactly what the story is gonna be with stat three loss of function and, and transplants. But DOC8, they get better. They absolutely get better when they have their transplants. Um, one of the things you'll hear about in DOC8 deficiency is that they're missing TH17 cells, which are also missing in STAT. They're not missing, they're low, they're not really missing. In STAT3 loss of function, they're missing. Um, but honestly, that test is just not that important in the context of having a genetic test, a genetic diagnosis. It's much more important in that case. Um, oh, here are some great uh, transplant pictures of how much better these folks can get after the transplants, both in terms of the eczema, 
and in terms of the viral infections. Okay? PGM3 deficiency is also recessive. Um, there's a major founder mutation, so they're, they're in Tunisia, they have a whole bunch of cases because there's a gene that's very common in Tunisia. Um, and, uh, but there are cases in America and all around. Um, the patients have severe atopic dermatitis, high IgE, food allergy, asthma, every allergic thing you can imagine, PGM3 deficient patients have. Um, they have recurrent bacterial descent of pulmonary infection. They get EBV uh, mono um, that stays in their blood for a long time. They have diffuse demyelination or dysmyelination. They don't have normal myelin in their brain. Okay? Um, and um, that can cause things like myoclonus, which is abnormal muscular movements. Um, uh, if you do a test for evoked potentials, there's a delay between how long it takes, like let's say light or something on your skin to make it to the brain. Um, so they have neurocognitive delay. They also could have scoliosis and other connective tissue problems like you might see in stat 3 loss of function. Um, they have very high immunoglobulin levels of all sorts. <clears throat> Their B cells don't look completely normal. They can have low counts of, of white blood cells. They do have autoantibodies. Um, and these are just two of the families that we've seen, but there have been many more that have been described. Interestingly, when it's more severe, they can have severe combined immune deficiency, and they have no allergies. Why? Why does that happen? Severe combined immune deficiency. They've got no, uh, basically not no T cells and barely any B cells that are that are working. So why do they have no allergies? And, and then they have no allergies because you need an immune system to have allergies. So if you don't have your immune system, you're not going to have allergies. Okay. So oddly, a little bit of an immune system is worse than no immune system when it comes to allergic disease. Okay. So in this in this disease, you could someone say your baby has PGM3 deficiency, and you're like, there's no eczema. What are you talking about? There's no hyper IgE syndrome. But the answer is because they're, it's, it's skid, and actually they did completely fine with transplant, totally fine. So some of them were diagnosed after they'd already had their transplant. Um, there's the scoliosis and the eczema on the same, same patient. Um, why does this actually matter? This is a pathway that every single one of us, and I can guarantee you, fell asleep during medical school learning about this. Um, PGM3 is what turns one sugar into another sugar in a pathway that's important for putting sugars on proteins. Okay? When you do your blood typing, or if you ever have to have your hemoglobin A1C measured, those are examples of sugars on proteins. Okay? This is a fundamental problem with putting sugars on proteins all over the body. Completely losing the function of this protein would lead, you, it wouldn't make it past an embryo. Okay? So the protein works a little, just doesn't work all the way. And the reason why that matters is actually if you can give a little bit, oh, come on. You can do it. There we go. Um, if you give N-acetylglucosamine, which you can get at your local GNC, uh, if you drop them on this patient's cells, you can restore the levels of sugar um, in the patient. We actually did a trial of this in patients at the NIH. We made their immune system so much better, they got worse autoimmune disease. So that's why we do the trials. But the point is, learning about the pathway at least gets us something closer to uh, uh, actually correcting the, the problem, besides doing it, instead of doing it, bone marrow transplant. So we're still working on that. Okay. Um, so this is the CARD11 mutations that I was telling you about. These patients have, it's dominantly inherited, and they can have bad eczema. They can have molluscum. They do not have to have molluscum. This is molluscum contagiosum, which is a viral rash. They get a bad, bad eczema. Um, and they can have other issues like autoimmune problems. They can have infections of the respiratory tract, but not all of them do. And we've absolutely had a case where a kid came in, he had bad eczema and also a viral infection over the eczema called eczema herpeticum, which is a herpes virus. And that's what the kid had, terrible. IgE was like 50,000 or 100,000, really, really high. And the mom said, I had eczema when I was a kid, but I grew out of it. So I don't have anything to do with him. They both carry the same mutation that causes the disease. Okay, so it can cause very highly variable things um, depending on, on who it, that it's in. Um, and actually, once again, um, the problem may be metabolic. Um, and one of the problems it might be is that this protein, CARD11, is really important for getting glutamine, which once again, you can get at your local GNC, from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Um, and when we put glutamine on the patient's cells, it does make it better. So once again, we didn't learn our lesson from the PGM3. We're going to give glutamine to the patients um, who have cartilage mutations to see if we can help. Um, and again, 
you know, this is how we'll learn. It may well help improve. This time we know we're a little bit better ch chance it's going to work. Um, preemies who are supplemented with glutamine are protected from eczema. Okay, so that's we're a little bit more confident that this one might be uh, helpful. But it's a fundamental pathway, perhaps for all sorts of allergic disease, not just patients who have mutations in in CAR11. But again, it's just these are all new. Ten years ago, we've never seen any of these other reasons why you'd have a syndromic high IgE. And now we have a lot more. And there are tons of patients who have these cardiac mutations, lots of them that are out there. Um, uh, again, in this case, if you're missing CARD11 completely, you have severe combined immune deficiency. That had already been described. These patients have milder versions, milder mutations, so they can have enough to make an immune response but not enough to completely protect them against the eczema and if they get infections, the infections that they get. Um, they can get better over time. Their eczema can get better over time. They do get the pulmonary infections, the food allergies, asthma, whatever. Also have viral skin infections, not just molluscum, but HSV um, and all sorts of stuff, herpes, all sorts of stuff like that, and eczema herpetigum on the skin. Um, really high eosinophil levels, high IgE. Um, nothing significant on labs for most of the patients. Nothing significant. I mean, in terms of their looking at the rest of their immune system besides the IgE and the eosinophilia. Okay, I'm done with my soapbox, and um, no, Dr. Heimel <laughs> will get on hers, and then we'll answer, I'll come up here and we'll answer yeah. questions at the end. I thought it'd be interesting to keep the air moving in the cl in the smaller room by us, <laughs> like serving as fans walking around. So. Getting back to some of now the older, uh, an older immunodeficiency that has always been associated with high IgE. When this syndrome, uh, you know, when Wiscott was first described, it was one of the first syndromes in, in, in the 1970s that was also described to have a high IgE, but this is X-linked, so predominantly affects boys, although we're now starting to see more symptoms in female carriers who may be significantly lionized. But again, there's a pattern here that we're seeing, right? In addition to having high IgE, there's an element of immune dysregulation with autoimmune disease um, showing as low um, red blood cells, platelets, or neutrophils, another kind of white blood cell. These patients can have really bad vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels and can present with a really significant colitis that at first might be thought to be a milk protein allergy, but it can actually be inflammatory bowel disease or very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. These patients commonly have sinopulmonary infections, um, herpes, herpes family virus susceptibility, and that kind of relates back to the, the exact problems that they have with some of their immune cells. Um, they can have bruising because they characteristically are going to have low platelets, so they don't clot as well as they should. They have eczema that is typically moderate to severe and presents early in life, and they have a higher rate of having lymphomas. So what we often see are the kind of low platelet counts. Over time, they will tend to lose their T cells, but they're not going to get picked up on a newborn screening, although there have been some that do. Um, the T cells don't usually work right. Um, the T cells don't function, you know, when they're stimulated. Um, and the NK cells are why we see, you know, why we think we see this trouble with the herpes virus. Um, but they characteristically have an elevated IgE, but they hadn't been thought of as being a hyper IgE syndrome. So again, pointing out why you don't really want to use that term. We want to be specific about the disease that we're talking about. Um, this is kind of the classic scoring system that had been used in the past to kind of decide just how severe um, the mutation was. So, um, you know, over here um, are patients who um, have excellent thrombocytopenia, but as you accumulate more of the symptoms that I described, you become more thought of as having um, a classic Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. And in the past, the thought had been, well, these patients with XLT, you know, they, they're fine and they don't really need a definitive therapy, but there's increasing evidence that although the survival for those patients is still pretty good, they have a lot of complications. They can have really severe food allergies that they anaphylax from. From the autoimmune disease, particularly uh, causing low platelets or being associated with their you know, low platelets, they can have significant bleeding problems, like bleeding into the brain problems that, that really affect life. Um, and then there is that risk of malignancy. But interestingly, we always knew there was a higher rate of food allergy, but it was really just described um, recently, whoops, 
that not, not just the actual um, Wiscott patients have a higher rate of food allergy than the general population, but um, so do these X-linked thrombocytopenia patients. Um, again, kind of supporting the fact that it, it's, it's not just okay to kind of watch those X-linked thrombocytopenia patients. They were probably candidates for definitive therapy as well. Related to that with mutations in the same gene are, as I've mentioned, X-linked thrombocytopenia. There's also X-linked neutropenia, um, which is an activating mutation. So it's like kind of like gaining function of the Wiscott uh, gene that's associated with low neutrophil counts um, and the uh, attendant infections that come along with that that are different than the viral infections that we tend to see with T-cell problems. But these patients also have a higher risk of food uh, allergies. Um, Mutations um, in Wiscott um, inhibitory protein are also associated with seeing the same symptoms as Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Um, and, and this is another protein that normally helps to inhibit the, the Wiscott Aldrich um, protein that if, you, if it's not working right, you end up seeing, again, similar symptoms. Um, to touch on IPEX, as Dr. Milner had kind of nicely introduced for us already, the symptoms that we tend to see are early onset type 1 diabetes, early onset of autoimmune enteropathy. This isn't very early onset inflammatory bowel disease, but it's more a watery, secretory diarrhea that doesn't allow these kids to gain weight. Um, you know, they, they look um, very sadly like children who are, are from famine regions um, where they, they just pour out nutrients um, from, from their gut. Um, these patients have severe um, early onset eczema um, and other um, symptoms of autoimmune disease. Um, so uh, baldness, having autoimmune liver disease, renal disease, low cell counts, um, recurrent bacterial infections, often of the ears, sinuses, uh, and lungs. Um, but they also have these allergic symptoms, food allergies and asthma. You know, there's a spectrum of the mutations that we see in the FOXP3 gene, and some of them don't present in infancy. Some of them will present uh, kind of later in life, um, and they may have uh, a milder mutation that still allows a little bit uh, of function of, of the protein. So in terms of lab findings, they have a high IgE, they have high eosinophil counts, um, they may develop a protein losing enteropathy, but otherwise that would cause loss of immune proteins in addition to other proteins, but otherwise the, the other immune proteins are usually normal. They, we have biomarkers that we can look for for development of autoimmune disease if this diagnosis is suspected. Um, and their T cells and their B cells otherwise really don't look abnormal to basic flow cytometry. You really have to do the specialized flow cytometry to look for the lack of Treg cells in these patients to assist with the diagnosis until you have a genetic diagnosis. Um, and then there are specific cytokines um, that tend to drive toward making more IgE that are higher in these patients at the expense of pro-inflammatory um, cytokines like interferon gamma. So Comal Netherton syndrome, oh, the, the animation did not happen the right way on this slide, so sorry about that. Um, but it's due to um, autosomal recessive mutations in a gene called SPINK5. Um, as Dr. Milner um, indicated, SPINK5 is expressed in skin cells and thymus epithelium cells, so it affects both skin function as well as T cell development. These patients have this characteristic appearance to their hair. They have brit very brittle hair that breaks off really easily, so um, they often kind of sport very, very short haircuts when we see them in clinic. Um, but if you look at it under microscope, you have this hair shaft that's on top of each other. And then they have these other symptoms that you can um, read. Um, what you can see here is that the, uh, what you can't see here, rather, um, is that, that they um, often have poor NK cell function, but that the numbers of those cells are often pretty normal. And same with their T cells. They may have a borderline low T cell function, but the overall numbers look pretty good. They all have a high IgE. I, I have a couple of Netherton patients, and they, they all have high IgE. Some of them have an increase 
in the other immunoglobulins, but when we look at their specific ability to respond to, say, the Pneumovax vaccine, which is a sugar-based vaccine that leads to a response that's really just driven by your B cells instead of requiring your T cells and B cells to have a conversation to make immunoglo-directed uh, immunoglobulin, this is often impaired in these patients. Um, so it can kind of help direct us um, in thinking about our testing. Oh, there we go. Oh well. Best laid plans, right? Um, so these patients, in terms of their treatment, um, don't typically respond well to just traditional eczema therapy or using oral antibiotics to help with some of the infections. But when you can start them on immunoglobulin replacement for that specific antibody deficiency that they manifest in terms of not responding to Pneumovax, um, they um, have remarkable improvement in their eczema, and there is a study that demonstrated that that NK cell function also improved for mechanisms that are not entirely well characterized. Caramel-1 deficiency is uh, another autosomal recessive uh, disorder that affects the ability of the um, cytoskeletal actin uh, filaments to come together that allows cells to move and to talk to each other in the right way. So many of these diseases have that same underlying mechanism that the cells can't move the right way and they can't talk to each other the right way, doing what we call the immunologic synapse. These patients, similar to Wiscott and similar to DOC8, which are both also associated with that actin cytoskeleton problem, have HPV, HSV, VZV, molluscum as part of their problem, but they have been described to have asthma that does somewhat respond to steroids, so it is truly asthma and not just infections that are being called asthma, um, but they more uh, quickly can pr uh, progress to being bronchiectasis or scarring of the lungs. Um, they have very early onset inflammatory bowel disease been described, um, Epstein-Barr virus, which is a herpes virus, triggering development of malignancy, and eosinophilic-driven uh, GI disease has also been described in Carmel II patients. These patients have reduction in their, not POXP2, FOXP2 T regulatory cells. <laughs> Sorry, heavy, you know, mitten fingers on the typing there. Um, they have increased numbers of their naive cells, but they don't progress to making good, mature memory cells that know what they're doing. They have low TH17 cells. So again, that's another pattern that we're seeing of something that, you know, can be looked for clinically as a hint that there's something more than just eczema going on in this um, cohort of, uh, of folks that we care for in our clinics. Um, and these, uh, these patients with Carmel II um, don't make as much interferon gamma, but all of their immunoglobulins are often elevated, uh, but then they don't make goods directed. So they have a lot of immunoglobulin, but it, it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't actually um, respond when they get vaccines. Um, and this is just, again, kind of the published pictures of what some of the skin inflammation can look like in these patients. And this is, uh, again, similar to what we're seeing in the others, uh, significant uh, cutaneous viral infections or warts and molluscum. So just to, you know, kind of bring us back to the practical aspect of this, when is having, I, having a high IgE level a, a syndrome? Because we've learned now from the syndromes that, that uh, Josh and I have gone over that high IgE can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be genetic, it can be driven by environmental factors like parasites, um, and it can be driven by infections. Um, but most commonly, it's going to be caused by having super duper bad eczema. So even if the IgE is through the works, uh, through the roof, um, and the eczema is really, really bad, um, if we can get the eczema under good control and we can treat it aggressively with good topical steroids, some of the newer systemic medications, using things like wet wraps and controlling infections that may drive some allergic inflammation that's not associated with primary immunodeficiency, we can see a downtrend in high IgE in patients who don't have an associated genetic cause for their high IgE. But in rare court cases, there is a genetic cause, and we should have, uh, you know, a high level of suspicion uh, wanting to think about that. We know of, you know, this list of a few diseases, but we are always looking for more um, because we know that there are, are a lot out there. There are a lot of patients out there that we just haven't figured it out yet. This is a constantly evolving field. 
Um, and as Josh said, you know, 10 years ago, when Josh and I worked together more com com commonly, there were only two, two diseases really that were on that hyper IgE list. So, you know, things are rapidly expanding in this space and there's a lot to be learned um, from, you know, talking with patients and, and talking with others in the field who are looking into this. So it's a really exciting time to think about high IgE, eczema, and allergies as being part of the spectrum of primary immunodeficiency. So the practical approach for you to think about and for you to talk with your doctors about, when should we be thinking about the high IgE being a syndrome? when the eczema started right away, right, right after delivery, within like a day or two. Dr. Uh, Josh liked to often say, I remember, straight out the chute. Um, you know, I remember him saying that all the time. So if it happened right away, uh, think about eczema. If the asthma or the eczema doesn't respond to a medium potency steroid, so something like Westquart, um, that is often a sign that we should look harder. If you need to, if you're at a point where you're thinking of taking a systemic biologic for your asthma or your eczema and you have a high IgE, thinking about a primary immunodeficiency is a reasonable thing to do with some basic screening that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Certainly though, patients who have severe recurrent skin infections that are viral mediated or severe staphylococcal abscesses, recurrent fungal infections, recurrent non-cutaneous infections, a lot of lung infections, a lot of sinus infections, or certainly any deeper tissue infections should prompt more investigation. And of course, it goes without saying that if there's a family history of someone who has the gene and you've got another person who looks awful lot like that person, for the same gene. They, things that run in families run in families. It's worth looking for. So. The basic place to start um, and to have the conversation about is check <coughs> cell counts with a basic CBCD. Look at the absolute lymphocyte count and the absolute eosinophil count. So um, I know a lot of you probably have access to your labs through your patient portals. Um, looking at those things and having a conversation with your doctors about those things is it, it, a good thing to do. Um, testing. Oh, that should say IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE, not to test IgA twice, but looking at all of your immunoglobulins, because IgE is often also the forgotten immunoglobulin that doesn't get tested. It, it's kind of like, you know, the underdog in the immunoglobulin world. So always asking about looking for an IgE level is important, and then checking specific titers to vaccines. And then if you're having infections, culture, figure out what the infection is, First of all, it's a direct therapy the right way. And second of all, knowing what kind of infections people are experiencing can really help us tease out what gene might be really the problem underlying things. And culture, you know, the spit too, you know, things coming up from the lungs usually are a problem. So when we look at the T cells, we want to make sure we're looking at the T cells in terms of their naive and their memory cells. Because as you saw in those slides, the different syndromes had different patterns of what we see, and knowing the differences there can help us to think about what genetic diagnoses may be more likely. Looking at a group of T cells called the gamma delta T cells are expanded in certain combined immunodeficiencies that we really didn't spend a lot of time talking about today, um, but it's another whole class of immunodeficiency that very commonly has significant eczema or erythroderma and a very high IgE and a very high eosinophil level. So it has many features that look the same as the classic hyper IgE syndromes. Um, looking at B cells, but not just a total B cell count, but the in-depth um, profiling of B cells to check that they're growing up to be switched memory B cells that can actually make good quality, not just reasonable quantities of immunoglobulin, and looking for those Th17 cells that, as we've mentioned, are, are absent or, or just low in many of these diseases are all things that can be done clinically um, without the help of a research lab. Um, looking at how well your lymphocytes proliferate when they're stimulated at a in a petri dish, um, and then considering genetic testing, um, and this can be done through panels or whole exome sequencing, depending. But that's a conversation that should be had after you maybe go through some of these other stages. 
So the treatments for um, these syndromes is generally supportive. Um, in terms of thinking about the allergies, it's really kind of doing the regular standard of care. So using the antihistamines, using the topical steroids. So topical nose sprays, topical uh, inhaled steroids for uh, lung, you know, for asthma. The skin care really has to be aggressive for eczema uh, in general. Um, so using good barrier emollients. So this is not the time to whip out Bath and Body Works Freesia <laughs> scent. Um, we want to be using like Vaseline, thick. Um, I, you know, I have some. I have, a, I have a large inner city population in Philadelphia. Some people can't use Vaseline. Crisco is great. We say we want you to be greased up like the butterball turkey for Thanksgiving. Just head to toe, shining when you go to bed is the way you should be, and that really gives a lot of relief and helps many kids sleep better through the night. Um, using the topical steroids the way they're prescribed. So it's really important that we try to use um, ointments instead of creams um, because the creams, um, the, the vehicle that's in the creams can cause an allergic contact irritation that can flare the eczema. So I've had patients who come and their eczema isn't responding well and we switch them from being on, an, on a cream to being on an ointment and they get much better and then we do patch testing and voila, they actually have a contact you know, problem to something that was just in the vehicle of the cream itself. The other thing is that the ointments are better absorbed. Um, so you get more bang for your buck out of using an ointment over a cream, but it has to always be done under the emollient because if you put it on top of the emollient, you can imagine you know, you're, put it, you're, you're greased up like the butterball turkey. And you know, if you think about how you make your turkey on Thanksgiving, you usually season and then you put you know, your grease on top of it. You put your oil on top of it because you want your seasoning to get in. You want your your seasoning of your steroid to get in so that it, it can really do its job to decrease all this inflammation from these T cells that have run amok. Um, when you have breaks in the skin for eczema, so you know that dry skin cracks easily, you get fissures, especially on the fingers, the toes, and on the wrists, using a topical antibiotic ointment to keep them from becoming infected, even in standard eczema, because standard eczema patients without having immunodeficiency have trouble controlling staph as an inflammatory part of their eczema. So if we can keep that at bay a little bit, um, that helps. Um, but then for more severe cases, we will do things like wet wraps. Um, I'm happy to get into that in more detail, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna just kind of leave it as a one-liner, um, and bleach baths periodically through the week, or swimming in a chlorinated pool often helps for many patients. Um, in patients who um, have demonstrated trouble with recurrent mucocutaneous candidiasis, we use antifungal prophylaxis. Um, in patients who have had recurrent staphylococcal infections using anti-staphylococcal uh, directed antibiotic prophylaxis, and in selected patients, particularly if there's an element of a specific antibody deficiency, using immunoglobulin replacement um, is really helpful. Josh kind of touched a little bit on the role of transplant in some of these diseases. So as he mentioned, the, the evidence is really there that if we identify DOC8 deficiency, this is a form of combined immunodeficiency. They do very well post-transplant, and the sooner we get those patients to transplant before they have other body system complications, the outcomes are better. So early transplant in DOC8, yep. Early transplant in IPEX, when there's a complete interruption in the function, yep, associated with better outcomes. For Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, usually yes. Um, there are, again, as I was alluding to, particularly for the patients who fall on the milder spectrum, there are some in the field who will debate it, but that's a conversation that should be had with the, your treating team um, uh, to decide what the right decision is. And in STAT-3 uh, deficiency, it's variable, although there's an increasing uh, body of evidence that particularly for patients who are having significant lung complications early in life, transplanting um, can actually uh, be, be quite helpful for those patients. Um, and then in these others, um, there are relatively few patients that have been described to have gone through transplant and have long-term follow-up, meaning more than two to five years out from transplant. So uh, I think you know we're going to need a, to have tincture of time uh, in terms of deciding what the right course of action is for treatment in those. So the take-home messages for today's talk um, is that IgE can be 
elevated for lots of different reasons. Um, it can be a known syndrome. It could be an unknown syndrome that we have to figure out, or it could be just bad allergy. Um, that because we have so many ways to do genetic testing now and we can sequence whole genome, whole exomes and soon we'll clinically be able to do whole genomes, we're constantly finding new pathways for the IgE to be high. Um, but um, the treatment really kind of needs to be personalized to the individual patient and what they're experiencing and what their health is at a given time. So um, there's no one umbrella way that, uh, you know, even patients with the exact same genetic diagnosis need to be treated. It does have, it should be part of a conversation that you have with your local doc to decide what's the right, right course of action for you and your family. Um, so that is it uh, in terms of our formal presentation. We now have 20 minutes. Sorry, we meant to have a little bit longer time. Uh, but uh, we have about 20 minutes that we'd love to take questions and have discussion, chit chat, that sort of thing. And there was one thing I did want to add um, about treatment, and that is the very, very new treatment of uh, dupilumab or dupixent, um, which is an injectable that is now approved for um, eczema and um, asthma. asthma. Absolutely is worthwhile to try in almost any of the syndromes. There's mm -hmm. no reason just because there's something wrong with the immune system doesn't mean that blocking one that other part of the immune system isn't a, a very good idea. And so we've definitely had patients who've gone on who have known genetic diagnoses but have bad eczema or asthma, or asthma. and they have absolutely gotten better on, on dupilumab. So it's... Dupilumab or dupixent, and it's approved down to age 12. Yes. You could buy a couple of Buicks with a year's worth. You could buy a couple of Buicks with a year's worth of therapy, but, um, and so you have to go through a lot of hoops um, to get it approved, but D-U-P-I-X-E-N-T, -D Dupixent, um, certainly, Dupilumab yeah. is the generic, yeah. certainly um, is, it's, it, there's no reason just because you have an, a, a known genetic defect that that's not a thing to, to, to try. Consider. But if you just have high IgE, and you do not have asthma, and you do not have eczema, there is zero reason to take dupilumab because the IgE is just there. It's not doing anything to you. Right. You will know it when it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a combined IgE replacement with the dupixent medication? So what dupixent does is it targets, the, so I had mentioned IL-13 and IL-4 on one of the slides. Dupixent targets the receptor for both of those cytokines, um, and so it does tend to drive down the IgE. Interestingly, in the beginning of therapy for patients who are on it, we often see a bump in their eosinophils because Ig IL-13, IL-4, and IL-5 are often all secreted together, and IL-5 often drives um, more eosinophils to be produced, but that usually settles itself out. Um, and most patients that I've had on dupilumab, they usually show a clinical improvement within about six to eight weeks of being on the drug. It's a really quick response. Um, what I also didn't include is that Zolaire, which is an anti-IgE, while it's great for asthma, does not work for eczema. It, it really doesn't, you know, the clinical trials and the, and the evidence is that I've had patients who have significant asthma and eczema both who were on uh, omalizumab or Zolaire um, before dupilumab came out because Zolaire has been out for 12 years, I think it is at this point, or maybe even more than that. Um, their eczema, it, it's not touched. Um, so those patients that those we're now switching them over to dupilumab because it'll target both. Do they take both? Or do they take no, both? we'll we switch them. One or the other. Right, right. We don't generally give two biologics. Works just like Zoller as well. No, so no. Really. So it's no, well, it is. It, yeah, <laughs> <I was gonna, laughs> in terms of its efficacy for asthma, um, it's probably similar. In terms of its efficacy for eczema, right. Um, Omaluzumab or Zolaire is not at all effective, whereas Dupilumab is effective for both. On the asthma side, they're both good. Yes, yeah. But again, for asthma, um, it's if you have elevated IgE and or ele interestingly, if you have eosinophilic asthma, it's the prefer it, it, it's indicated as a treatment for eosinophilic asthma, even though it can raise the IgE level. And another point is, is that if the IgE is too high, you can't give Zolaire. Mm -hmm. It won't work. Mm -hmm. um, 
because it blocks the IgE in a certain, so you'd have to like back up a truck of, of Zolair to get people who have like really, really high um, IgE levels. And so there, there, that's where the dupilumab is, is that much more helpful because you can give to someone, it doesn't matter what the IgE level is. But you know yeah. Well, it's really, really high. You have to, if you yeah. calculate it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. You, you have to go to the, I mean, and, and, and it, 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 it will be clear. Um, is it common to have extremely elevated IgE levels and consequently also extremely low or no IgA levels? Is that relatively common or is that two different things? They're usually two different well, things, but... It, it's evidence that you may have in it. Something's wrong defect. with the B cells. Right. It's not uncommon. Yeah. But matter. one is not causing the other. So the, the same problem causes both. So your B cells are what make your immunoglobulin? So in your blood, you have white blood cells, and then there's kind of different flavors of white blood cells. There's neutrophils, there's lymphocytes, there's eosinophils. And then within the lymphocytes, there's three main flavors. There's T cells, there's B cells, and there's NK cells. The NK cells are kind of like the, um, uh, you know, the, the snipers that go out and kill either, you know, uh, herpes virus infected uh, cells or uh, malignant type cells. The um, T cells, I like to think of as being special ops that direct a lot of different things. And the B cells are um, a little bit more, uh, in they think about sending out troops of mission, troops. You know, they're kind of generals that send out a whole bunch of different immunoglobulins that are directed for different missions. Um, I, I did part of my training while working at Walter Reed, too. So there was some. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how I usually describe it in clinic, too. Uh, they like it. But so if your B cells don't work right, because they're the ones that make these troops of immunoglobulins that come in, you know, different brigades that go fight different battles, um, if you're not, if you don't make the, uh, I, you know, the IgA, then you have IgA deficiency, but you can have normal IgG and IgM and IgE despite that. 